So it's uh, two o'clock. Let's start the session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Atif. I am at Johannes Kepler University at the LIT Institute of Technology. Uh, and I welcome you all to this session, uh, which is dedicated to security and privacy for the smart factory. And uh, this session uh, is being organized by myself, uh, my esteemed colleague uh, Rudolf Ramler, who is representing Software Competence Center Hagenberg, and also uh, Professor Thomas uh, Schlechter, who is at the University of Applied Sciences and Upper Austria. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, that is uh, Michael, who will be presenting Multi-Mode Systems for Resilient Security in Industry 4.0. Uh, rather, we have uh, limited time, so I would like every speaker uh, to take from 10 to 12 minutes so that we have an ample time for fi about five minutes uh, for a healthy uh, Q&A session. OK, thank you very much. And Michael, over to you. Thank you, Aptif. I hope you can see now uh, my screen. Yes, I do. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. It's a pleasure for me to present you our work about multi-mode systems for resilient security in Industry 4.0. My name is Michael Rieger and I wrote this paper together with Professor Johannes Sametinger and we are both involved in the LIT Secure and Correct Systems Lab at Johannes Kepler University, Linz, Austria. After a short introduction on Industry 4.0 and smart manufacturing, I will tell you more about the window of vulnerability of industrial automation and control systems. We imagine to use multi-mode systems to improve system security and resilience. Several sample mode switch scenarios should underpin our approach. And after that, I will provide benefits and possible drawbacks from a security point of view. At the end, I will conclude with a summary and the planned next steps. In the area of Internet of Things, things more and more devices were connected. Physical devices like machines, robots and sensors are connected uh, with various protocols like UPC, UA, MQTT and others. Remote monitoring allows support and control across several locations. The targets of the industry can be divided into efficiency and flexibility. They want the reduction of downtimes, lead times, waste, and as well costs. Moreover, recent innovations in electronics and communication allow more flexibility. Batch size one, digital twin, Big data analytics and predictive maintenance are today's buzzwords. NIST defines smart manufacturing as fully integrated collaborative manufacturing systems that respond in real time to meet changing demands and conditions in the factory, in the supply network, and in customer needs. But connectivity has also its downsides. According to the Allianz Risk Barometer 2020, Cyber incidents become the most important business risk in front of business interruption and climate change. In 2019, 2 billion IoT devices were affected by zero-day vulnerabilities, which allowed remote code execution. And in 2020, not only the COVID-19 lockdown in several countries led to production downtimes. The Belgian loom manufacturer Piet Canol and the German car parts company Gedea had to send over 1,500 people home after cyber attacks. The time span between a vulnerability becomes known and the patch to fix it is available and installed is critical. As availability is one of the top goals of an industrial automation and control system, simply stopping a machine is the worst case scenario as it typically means losing money. Moreover, you may need a safe way to free people and objects from the system during and after an attack. Developing updates and patches are needed, but that may take a comparably long time. 
due to safety, certification and warranty requirements, updates and patches must be tested extensively. If the patch is released, it should be installed as soon as possible. But patches may not know and there is the fear that patching may interfere operations. In the meantime, hackers can find the vulnerabilities on their own, use published information also about the patch to attack unpatched systems. For sure, we have to speed up this process of patch development and installation. And it would be even more important to develop secure systems right from the start. But state-of-the-art authentication and cryptography methods may be out of date in a few years. Manufacturers and component suppliers may discontinue support and some manufacturers may even go bankrupt. Imagine to use multi-mode systems to bridge the critical phase. Multi-mode systems are used to master complex systems and this well-known approach is used in aviation, self-driving cars, medical monitoring, traffic control, and power plants. Systems are divided into logical, controllable, and entanglement modes of operations, like you can see on the slide. Each mode has different goals, as well as its unique behavior, and it's characterized by a set of functionalities. The multimodal architecture makes a system more flexible to respond to external events. Airplanes have modes for parking, taxiing, takeoff, manual and automatic cruising flight, landing, and possibly what you can't see here on the slide, an emergency mode with special capabilities. A mode switch is used to change the behavior, for example, from taking off to cruising flight or from cruising flight to landing. Modesway may prevent a plane crash. For example, if thrust reversal is not allowed during the takeoff and climbing mode. Moreover, you can allow and disallow specific functions like extending the landing gear and so on during cruising flight. The same will work for industrial automation systems as well. We want to improve system security and resilience, even in case of zero days, by switching modes automatically and manually, and that reduces attack surface and attacker's range of activity without stopping a system in order to provide mission critical capabilities for business continuity. We imagine to detect anomalies and events with existing methods like our research partners in Arizona introduced a time-based intrusion detection for embedded systems. If a sensor detects a threat with adaptive risk mitigation, automatically a mode switch is done to re restrict communication and reduce attack surface. In case of a denial of service attack or brute force attack on the authentication systems should switch modes after a certain number of attempts and deny further access. After the adverse event in a specific time, the system can recover complete with all functionality, partial with limited functionality or minimal, like you may know the limp mode from cars. Another countermeasure could be to switch to a mode where only one, com one way communication is allowed. This should help in particular when there is an inability to install security patches or even if a manufacturer has discontinued support or no longer exists. Asset owners should have a possibility to change manually the mode. And notifications to asset owners and device manufacturers will help to respond early. Such notifications with the current mode information will make it more transparent what is going on on a specific device without knowing all technical details and may prevent further attacks and damage. Another area of application we imagine is to combine the modes of several systems uh, to a type mode, a factory or a global mode. If a certain number of machines 
change their mode and the value exceeds a defined limit, the global mode is changed, which in turn can affect the mode of all other machines, for example, to prevent the virus from spreading further. Mode switching will not provide a silver bullet to solve all security problems. An overall concept with several security layers is needed, uh, which considers the entire life cycle from architecture, design and implementation up to eventual decommission. We are focusing on mission critical capabilities. Mode switching will secure the time between vulnerability disclosure and the availability of security patches and installation. It can reduce the attack surface context sensitive and mode switching will provide more resilience to existing vulnerabilities. Asset owners and system operators can help themselves even if manufacturer does not provide updates or stop service. Overall, it should lead to lower machine downtimes caused by cyber attacks. Of course, there are also possible drawbacks of this approach that you have to consider. The mode switching mechanism can be misused by insiders and outsiders to reduce functionality and availability if they know how to trigger a mode switch. The system be even more complex and the design and development phase may be more extensive and more expensive. Moreover, there could be potential unintended negative side effects due to the multimodal architecture. To summarize the findings in short, we propose to use a multimodal architecture to reduce the attack surface without providing any upgrade, for example, by a manual mode switch. An intrusion detection system or another monitoring system can automatically detect and ward off attacks by switching modes. This should limit attackers' range of activity. And moreover, it should provide transparency and traceability for operators. Currently, we are working on a systematic literature review on mode switching protocols. We want to evaluate them and investigate how they could be applied in context of industrial automation control systems. A case study and a prototype should provide a deeper insight and should show if mode switching is a good method to ensure security and resilience in Industry 4.0. Moreover, we want to evaluate and compare the mode information of several systems to detect attacks very early and react fast before a wildfire occurs. So thanks for your attention and please stay safe, secure and healthy. And now I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Michael. It was indeed an uh, interesting talk. Uh, so any question from the audience? Uh, please raise your hand or leave the comment in the chat. OK, meanwhile, we wait uh, for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, Michael, I have a question. So have you already envisaged uh, an application scenario uh, where you're going to apply that multi-mode uh, switching system? Uh, yeah, we are currently uh, working with an industrial partner and thinking about to implement this approach, kind of a prototype uh, with a kind of an edge device. So a gateway between ma machines and, and uh, the central uh, control applications. And we think about to monitor uh, log files and, and other events on this device, on the machine, and then to respond to maybe attacks we identified and then uh, decrease the attack surface uh, with uh, switching the mode. The mode should be uh, a defined set of, of tasks and functionality what a <coughs> machine can do 
in a mode and what is not allowed in this mode. Okay, so I mean, what could be uh, the application uh, case study in that case? Application domain, like health system, for example? Yeah, we are also uh, working for medical devices. Uh, this uh, one of our focus and then another focus is on industrial machines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the approach uh, you are presenting and proposing uh, do you think it's a domain dependent or at, at certain level the approach remains intact and you just need a small variance for application uh, specific uh, details? I, I, I think it's uh, also working for other domains, not only for medical devices and industrial machines, also for, for global, like you see in the presentation that is mode switching is used in automotive power plants and other domains. Self-driving yeah, cars, for example. Approach, proposed approach. So do you think it will be application dependent or application independent? Application independent. OK, very good. Uh, so no question from the audience. Last chance before I thank Michael. OK, Michael, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, I would thank like you. to clap to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> There's no physical audience over here, but thank you very much for your talk. Okay, very good. Okay, so the next presentation is about PYBNBO. I don't know how to pronounce this. Sorry for that. <laughs> Python library for bow tie analysis based on Bayesian networks. And that will be presented by Frank. So over to you, Frank. So I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Okay. Um, I wrote the paper with uh, Eckhart Hellmann and Harald Lampesberger, and it's about risk. So all modern management systems like information security management and quality management demand that the decisions are taken on risk or, in, or cover risk. And we wanted to, or we want, no, if you look at the textbooks, they show you most often that risk is just uh, taken on the likelihood and on the, the severity of the risk. And this is a little bit easy and it's done not that often. And if you want to have an online uh, risk assessment, then you need something more complicated and we want to show how to use the bow tie analysis in conjunction with the Bayesian network to do some better risk assessment. So Bayesian networks, just some formulas. I think um, if you know them, you don't need that. If you don't know Bayesian networks, then yeah, I think you also don't need that. Um, at the end, it's uh goes down to the conditional probability so the probability that x happens given that y happened or or has already happened and you can simplify that in a network where you just put all the probability in a simple table and compute the probability of here c Bayesian networks are one part of artificial intelligence. There are several or a lot of applications, just to name a few, cybersecurity, safety analysis, reliability. Uh, there's a lot of software available, closed source, open source, and there are um, several software libraries available, I think for every major computer, uh, programming language, you can find several libraries. The drawback is that the creating of a Bayesian network does not guarantee a coherent model. That means with the same input, you can create the same output with different networks. And if you take a model to model transformation, you can create always the same network. And one model that you can start from is the 
bow tie analysis. Bow tie comes from the um, neck binder, not the tie. It's the the thing that James Bond always wears, and it's from the shape of the diagram. It connects causes and consequences. And in the middle, you have the top event. That's a critical event, but it's not the most or it's the most critical event, but it's not the disaster you will have. For example, in aviation, you have um, a lack of separation as a top event. That's not a crash. It just says that the two or that two airplanes are too close together and you come from some causes and you go to the top event and we know that as a fault tree analysis and to prevent the causes to go to the top event you can place um, safety barriers preventive barriers and if you have reached the top event you can go to the consequences and this is known as the event tree analysis and there you can also place some safety barriers to mitigate the outcome how's that constructed in reality you have the causes x here named x1 to xn and you add them together or you put them together with logical gates until you reach the top event and this is the really that's only one event and from there you branch to the consequences to all the different safety barriers and there are most often it's just the question does it work or not yes no works fails zero one um, there are gates that have more possibilities so how do we map these bow tie analyzers to a Bayesian network Bobbio et al showed how to map a fault tree analyzer so the left part to a Bayesian network it's just the connection of the two inputs or more inputs to an output and he has given the uh, conditional probability table for the right side the event tree analysis beerfield and march showed how to map these and here the initial initiating event in the both analysis will be the top event and they show how to um, construct the Bayesian network and they also show how to simplify that given the consequences and the events and finally Kaxat used these two algorithms to co to put them together and to create the, the on the one side the bow tie uh, the fault tree analysis on the right side the event tree analysis and connect them at the top event and the top event uh, is getting here the uh, pivot node. So we implemented that in Python 3. The input format for the bow tie analysis uh, was done in the input format open from open PSA model exchange format. It's quite old it's 12 years old and they have the possibility to describe um, fault tree and event trees and yeah it's, uh, there are some there's some software available and you can graphically see how your bow tie analysis looks or you can even construct it in the, in the software the Bayesian network was done in the library pgmpy it's from Ankan and panda and they are maintaining it it's the last the latest release is from end of september so after implementation you should prove what you've done we uh Kaxat showed um example of a mixing tank accident so you have a tank where you have some liquid inside and you have to heat that for another process if you heat it too much you can create vapor and that vapor you can ignite and if you have something that burns and you ignite you mainly get something 
yeah, that's very damaging. And so he created the Bota analysis to uh, to model the the risks that are there. And one nice thing of this Bota analysis is that you have not only a qualitative view, so all the events, in the the circles. There you can place uh, probabilities, but you also have a qualitative view. You see how the creation of vapor depends on other parts. And on the other side, on the uh, after you have the vapor, you can see the um, the safety barriers and the outcome. So we put that in the MEF format and transferred it. And here's the Bayesian network. We uh, inferred the Bayesian network and came up with the same result for the, uh, the same probability for the creation of vapor. But the consequences were different. So we, in the middle, the middle column, of the probability, the ETA, we used the software to model uh, the event tree analysis and we compared that and yeah, the results from the ETA and our bow tie diagram is the same. So we think the tables are very large and if you have to enter the values manually, then yeah, you can have a lot of, or you can, easily have some failures there. We did test with other published data and the results were the same. So this is just uh, a proof how, why you should optimize as much as possible to prevent human failure. Runtime, it's increasing exponentially. That's bad, but the good thing is the Library we implemented it's not the problem. Or yeah, the the, the exact infer exact inference of the Bayesian network takes for the top event ten times longer, and for the computation of the consequences one hundred times longer. So the creation of the Bayesian network it's yeah it's neglectable. So very quick walkthrough. I showed some, or oh, the BOTA analysis is widely used, mainly in nuclear industry and in the chemical industry. You can use it to show qualitative and quantitative results, and you can map it to um, Bayesian network, and from the Bayesian network, you can infer variables and what I didn't show is you can um, set values so you can compute what's what is the probability I need that I get an output of one for my uh, consequence five. Yeah, the project is available on GitHub and you can try it out if you find an error you're welcome to correct it or to tell me and then i will try to to fix the bug yeah thank you and questions are welcome uh thanks frank nice talk uh any question from the audience please i have a question about um application of uh, bow tie analysis in um, anomaly detection. Um, I'm wondering, but this may this may be a naive question because I, I'm not into uh, bow tie uh, analysis. I'm wondering if uh, using the, the probability as, uh, that uh, comes out of these models, if it's possible to optimize a, an anomaly detection model to attribute more or less costs about an anomaly, depending on what are the, the highest uh, predictable risks. Uh, 
<lacht> so, um, you can hold me. If you have that diagram, you can, um, if you place costs on the different consequences, mm -hmm. for example, C4 has the highest outcome, you can see what are the probabilities of the input. Mm -hmm. And then you can try to, to mitigate that or to put another uh, safety barrier there. So I okay. don't know if you can optimize that for sure, mm -hmm. um, but at least very quickly you can see where are the main problems or what 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 will change. I yeah, what what, what you get question. what you get is a uh, it's a sort of an anomaly detection system. Just you just you you just don't. Um, um, okay, I haven't done that. I just. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just asking. Uh, uh, I mean, looking at this, it, it really looks like a very useful application of of what you have done um, in in the anomaly detection field. Uh, because especially when it comes to industrial processes, it's hard from an IT security expert knowing how to, uh, for example, prioritize an alert. Um, how much importance do I give to to an anomaly? And uh, I mean, this model is, is is basically the explanation of anything that can happen in I mean, can happen in the system and how how the events are are structured. So it gives a very um, um, human friendly or um, descriptive analysis of uh, a high level consequence because it, you know it's something um, that is not usually happening in anomaly detection. What is nice here, as soon as you have such a structure, you can use all the input data and you can teach the Bayesian network the possible the probabilities. And I'm quite sure if you have the input, you see that something changes or if you can put some limits. Right. And so I'm quite sure you can use it. Uh, if you nice. use it for fraud detection, you should use be able to use it for that. Nice. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. It was indeed uh, a nice talk. I'm sorry I cannot take any further question because of time uh, limit. So uh, if somebody else has a question, uh, Frank can write his email address and please try to reach Frank uh, offline. So thank you very much, Frank. Thanks again for your very nice talk. Okay, so our next presenter is uh, Federico, and he will mm -hmm. be talking about smart factory security, a case study on a modular smart manufacturing system. So over to you, Federico. Thank you. Can you confirm you just see my screen, my yes, slides? I, I do. Okay, fantastic. Thanks. All right, so uh, my name is Federico Maggi. I work for Trend Micro Research, and uh, this, re this research comes out of a fruitful collaboration between uh, Trend Micro and uh, Politecnico di Milano. So, um, as we have seen uh, in the first talk of this session, uh, yes, smart manufacturing environments are a very attractive target for uh, cyber criminals. We have seen uh, Honda is probably the uh, one of the most striking examples, but uh, other examples have been mentioned in the first talk. There are cases where uh, entire factory floors had to uh, basically stop and hang the production because of a, an attack. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, uh, what we usually do in, in, in the world of cybersecurity to, to design uh, preventive measures or defensive, defensive measures. We do uh, attack scenarios and we try to um, simulate what can happen in, in, the, in a case of an attack and evaluate uh, what are the possible uh, ways that an attacker can uh, penetrate into an infrastructure. And uh, this time we've done it on a system where we had the luxury luxury or the peace of mind if you want um, to do basically what we want right which is which is uh, seldom happening in a in a real production network because you're afraid of downtime and things like that so what we had here is essentially a, a smart small smart factory in a box or better said in a room um, we focused on two attacks uh, although, although in the paper there are more uh, but for time constraints, I will just go to one of them. 
All right, so this uh, carousel-like uh, production environment produces uh, toy smartphones. Um, it starts with, uh, with a loader controlled by a PLC, and uh, each of the stations, of course, have their own HMIs. Then we go to the second station, which uh, is an assembly, an assembler with uh, all the cases, the top part of the case. Then we go ahead, we drill four holes in the corners of the case, and then we have a robotic arm that places a um, PCB and other components inside the case. Then we go through visual inspection using a camera that compares the model of uh, the reference model with the produced piece to see if there are any uh, discrepancies. And then we have another couple of um, steps until we get to the final product, which is placed back into onto the conveyor belt for the operator to pick up. You will see in the paper that there is this diagram that uh, it's a sort of a metric representation of um, the possibilities for an attack. Uh, we will focus on um, three um, entry points, although uh, I only have time to show you two entry points this time. And I will start from the engineering workstation at the top right of the screen. And there's also uh, other two um, entry points that I will very briefly touch. So let's start off with what can happen if, let's say that we are in a closed environment, uh, not none of these machines are directly reachable or exposed to the internet, so there isn't any possibility for a direct attack. Uh, but we found uh, and we show you a way that attackers can uh, still uh, get a bit more creative and uh, uh, find their way into the industrial plant. So um, on the engineering workstation, you will um, often find many of programs such as this one, OLP software, which is used in practice to uh, program, for example, the robot or the PLCs. And uh, the engineering workstation is quite uh, critical because it has uh, most of the time complete access, uh, administration level access to the other machines because it, it has to be able to change the logic, for example. One interesting thing that we noticed about uh, OLP software in general, although we focused on uh, ABB, is that uh, like many other software, they have uh, plugins such as extensions, software extensions that are used to um, augment their functionalities. And uh, the interesting thing about ABB's line, um, such as there are other cases like uh, KUKA, for example, they have a sort of uh, app store where you can go and download um, extensions or uh, even better, you can consume these extensions right into the uh, software on your on the engineering workstation. So what you're doing here, you're connecting to a trusted store in cloud store. This is in the in the case of ABB uh, and download some additional components. So in, in the, putting this in the perspective of our attack scenarios, it's of course um, an interesting attack opportunity for a cyber criminal because they could get into the uh, they could essentially deliver software to the engineering workstation going through the mechanisms of the app stores. And we verified that if the app store is uh, vulnerable, and this was the case of uh, ABB's app store, which now has been fixed thanks to our research, it was possible to bypass any control mechanisms put in place by the app store to have basically a direct path going from the machine of the cyber attacker to the engineering workstation. What is happening here is that even if the, as you can see on the left, even if the uh, probing extension that we have uploaded was only pending for approval, I mean, meaning that somebody has to take action and, uh, and approve it, that it was still available for one click immediate installation on the engineering workstation. And the same happened for the KUKA uh, product line, but I don't have to go, uh, I don't have the time to go into the details. So we have a direct path going from uh, the uh, attacker machine to the engineering workstation. Uh, a similar path can be done in other ways, and these are described in the paper. And um, I'm talking about industrial IoT devices, which are customizable, but 
I don't have much time to go into this. So I want to switch briefly to the role of uh, mobile HMIs. Mobile HMIs are becoming more and more popular, even though they are not the preferred way to do HMIs. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, some of them, such as the Komau one, which is shown here as an example, are almost directly connected to uh, over Wi-Fi in this case, almost directly connected to the control machine. And if there is a bug such as the one that we have found, they actually offer uh, an advantage to the attackers. For example, in this case, we had um, the application, which was a, which was a pick and place application for Komau robots, which had uh, an authentication routine. As you can see at the top, there is a login method here. Um, which was expecting some data from uh, from the user, such as the password to authenticate into to the robot and be able to control the robot. But what we found what we found is that by reverse engineering the app, an attacker like we simulated would be able to find the the ground truth essentially of that password and be able to use that ground truth to authenticate to all of the co controllers of the same brand. So this was, of course, quite a critical uh, vulnerability that thanks to our report uh, to Kumau has now been taken offline. Great, so now we have ticked, uh, ticked many, bo many boxes and uh, at this point, a real attacker would try to um, remain persistent and uh, maybe perform some product alteration. Um, so I would like to spend a few a few words about the role of uh, industrial robots in this um, in, in keeping allowing the attackers to remain persistent. Uh, as we all know, uh, uh, industrial robots are uh, programmable and they are pretty powerful, I would say, in the way they are programmed because they can um, basically programmed with the same uh, complexity uh, like you would program any computer. Their languages is are their languages are uh, complete. They contain any functionality essentially. And what you see here is an example of a vulnerability that if you're not a security expert, you may not have spotted uh, like the programmer that created this uh, real world application that was found and now deleted uh, on uh, on an application store, and the, according to this vulnerability, it was possible to for an attacker on the network to exfiltrate, for example, uh, data contained on um, on the controllers of the robot. We have inspected. I mean, this stimulated us uh, knowing more about these languages. So we we inspected the what we think are the eight most popular languages, and we found out that not only they are um, they like any other programming artifact, they could be affected by security vulnerability. Also at the language level, um, they have some primitives that make them particularly dangerous if used without any um, knowledge of um, program security. For example, file system access, direct file system access, uh, the possibility of calling a function by its name and when the name comes from the network, then you can have basically a remote code execution. And all of them, of course, they have to for communication. So, um, uh, to uh, all of this combined with the fact that um, um, the operating system does not Sorry, offer. For last minute, could you please wind up things? What do you say? Uh, could you please try trying to wind up because we are already running out of time? Yeah, I have two. Yeah. You said 13, 13 minutes, right? Yeah, sure. Just you just want I did not see any chat here, so sorry. Sorry, yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Okay, yeah, sure. Sorry. So the operating system here does not have um, um, uh, isolation. So what can happen is that uh, if you exploit a bug in one of these applications, then you can you have wide access to the entire system, not like it happens in modern um, in modern uh, operating system where each app is isolated. So uh, in order to find uh, bugs such as this one, uh, we have patented a um, data flow analysis system that allows you, for example, to find out if there is a networking um, routine in the logic, if there is a data flow that goes to the position 
to the positioning of the robotic arm. So you can find if there is any possibility for an external attacker to essentially alter the movements of the robot from the network. And we find that we find these cases automatically so uh, a developer can review them. Great, so um, now to summarize, um, in the paper you will find uh, other, other cases like uh, the one that I described, such as how can you alter essentially in a similar way the manufacturing execution system, which is the, the SCADA on board of, um, of these manufacturing systems. But uh, let's now wrap up a little bit and give you the references to the paper. So we have learned that uh, the attacker can get uh, very creative. They are uh, more, I think, more ecosystem focused than uh, device focused. Finding exploits in devices is fairly uh, easy and common these days, but what attackers uh, will do in the future, I think they will exploit the ecosystem of software because it's very hard to find a direct attack vector. It's much more easy to find an indirect one. And then we have just learned about how uh, task programs in a robotic uh, logic can become quite dangerous. And here you can find the references to the latest uh, two papers that we have published on the subject. And if you're interested, just uh, scan the QR code or take a note of the URL. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Federico. It was indeed a nice talk. Yep. Uh, sorry to bother you. Sorry to cut you short. No problem. Uh, okay, so any question from the audience? Okay, meanwhile, we wait for the question uh, from the audience. I would like to ask you, what would be the uh, research aspects? Uh, I mean, where do you think you can go in the future as far as research is concerned? There are, um, I think the most promising way is if you um, digging into how many ways all the machines can be programmed. So we dig, for example, in the, in the example of uh, robot programming, but I think that uh, other machines have uh, similar approaches to programming and um, these languages are very niche. I mean, they're not common languages such as C, Python or uh, the languages that we are used to. Uh, and there are specific ways to exploit uh, vulnerabilities that are inherent in the design of these languages. So I think that in the future, I would like to see more and more researchers uh, focusing on uh, language security for logic programming. Okay, very good. And do you think there's a difference between like factory in a box or factory in a room and the usual uh, cyber security aspects of other domains? So do you think does the confined environment impose some special challenges? Um, I think confined environments such as factory in a boxes um, are actually easy to manage, easier to manage from a security standpoint. Uh, you can think of them as the equivalent of data centers in Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. where you basically can plug and play uh, whole factories or whole production floors. Um, and from the management perspective, I think they are easy to uh, to maintain because you can basically create them as uh, templates. Uh, I mean, I don't want to mention the, the 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 virtual machines equivalent of that, but it's pretty much like having the uh, the bill of materials essentially of of uh, uh, of, an, uh, of, a, of an integrated circuit. Like, so you can, if you can describe the security properties of your factory in a box, then it's easier to uh, to maintain and deploy in the future. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Any other question from the audience? Okay, if there is, there is no further question, so I would like to thank you, Federico, once more. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. I'm going to pause for you. So, thanks. thanks. Okay, so our next speaker is Vagan, and he will be talking about taxonomy of generative adversarial networks for digital immunity of Industry 4.0 systems. So, over to you, Vagan. Hello, can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. What about now? Not yet. Okay. Let me try again.
now yes okay okay hello everybody and uh, i will be talking about uh, combination of uh, artificial intelligence and issues related to security of industry for zero and uh, i would like to greet also my co-authors from uh, beautiful ladies from ukraine who may be now listening to us also and uh, i am from uh, university of uvascula it's in central finland very cold uh, place usually and uh, uh, my colleagues are from uh, kharkiv it's uh, uh, one of the eastern europe uh, eastern uh, ukrainian cities and uh, we uh, consider uh, this uh, kind of uh, subject related to industry for zero from our own definition of what industry for zero is so what we believe that of course we are talking about flexible infrastructure so it's uh, that kind of cyber physical systems which are populated uh, with a, a lot of that kind of uh, various platforms, uh, devices, everything there from that side of flexible infrastructure. But also it's a kind of uh, place where there is automatic decision making taking place. So therefore uh, it needs some kind of collective intelligence there at, uh, which can be a combination of human and uh, artificial intelligence to make decision in critical points uh, how to rule the process. And when we're talking about vulnerability of industry for zero, so let's uh, use this kind of citation we are using that only amateurs attack machines, attack this kind of infrastructure or even software code. It's still something which is hard coded there. You can protect it using traditional cybersecurity approaches. But most vulnerable place we believe is that intelligence as such. Because intelligence is something that it's not hard coded, it's learned from data. And if it learned from data, like if I uh, let my child go to street, to school, to everywhere. So even if I give him a couple of uh, bodyguards, Still, I cannot close his eyes and ears, and I don't know how he take this input information and how he will make decisions after he learns on the basis what he see, what kind of movies he watch, and all this kind of stuff. So therefore, we have like not new type of vulnerability, never, which we never have before in this hard coded system, is that vulnerability of uh learning so how to protect our way we learn so we call call it like cognitive types of vulnerabilities and there are two uh, well-known types of attacks to uh, this kind of learning system or machine learning type of systems it's uh so-called poisoning attacks that some bad guys can poison the data from which our system learns and when it poisoned, then uh, the model which is uh, learned based on this poison data will do or decide in a way this bad guy wants. And also another type of uh, evasion attacks where uh, we poison this uh, real-time uh, testing data. Uh, also, this is also a, a very complicated type of uh, attacks for uh, the system. In both cases, the system will do wrong things. And in both cases, notice there's nothing touched. There is hardware, platform, software works perfectly as it is, but the system does or decides in the wrong way. Uh, as with COVID, uh, with this kind of uh, stuff must be protected, and uh, we human we believe that okay we either have some immunity or we expect that it will be some vaccination sooner or later that we can uh, inject something to us and it will protect us uh, against this kind of uh, bad stuff the same uh, approach we are taking also with uh, this kind of uh, uh, 
security we are talking about. We need immune system to protect artificial intelligence. And uh, for that, we also try to think whether we can generate a kind of digi digital vaccines, that kind of special content that if we inject it, uh, then even if something wrong comes to the mind of our system, it still will be compensated with these vaccines. So that's just a basic idea. And uh, from artificial intelligence and machine learning current inventions, one of the you know, best inventions nowadays, of course, it's known as uh, generative adversarial networks, is when uh, two models so you, you try to model both uh, that attacker and defender and you connect these two models which are usually based on artificial neural networks uh, so that uh, attacker generate attacks, uh, defender try to protect and if one of them fails they are receiving this kind of feedback through this uh, uh, feedback like and back propagation helps neural network to improve. So they are co-evolving together. Attacker be becomes much more sophisticated one and defender becomes much more sophisticated either. So therefore we uh, have, uh, uh, it's just one of our uh, project. It's uh, NATO SPS project, Cyber Defense for Intelligence Systems, where we consider that kind of uh, system which may have a particular uh, military object or process which can have also hard-coded control system but also it might include some artificial intelligence driven driven or trainable or learnable component and then it might must be some training system which trains this component and this training system may use training data outside from outside system or different kind of available context so we need to put some kind of protection in between we call it artificial immune system in between all these processes to protect our artificial intelligence uh, from the wrong data here uh, so uh, as I told you, we, uh, we are using this uh, concept of generative adversarial networks. So the basic picture of it is uh, here. So we have uh, some source of content, which is used uh, usually like for learning. And uh, this kind of content, it's uh, reality. And also we have some bad guy, generator of fakes, which try to create fakes of reality. Actually, uh, it assumes that this bad guy doesn't even have access to these real world uh, samples. So it generates it. And we have another good guy, which is also a neural network, which can get input from real world or from bad guy and doesn't know from whom its input comes. And it just must decide whether it's real, real or fake sample. And if it makes uh, wrong decision, then it receives that kind of punishment and uh, improves uh, its own weights of this neural network. Or if fake generate bad fake, which is discovered, then this neural network will get feedback. So they are together grow and uh, become very good in making this kind of uh, game against each other. So, what we try to do, we try to imp uh, assume, okay, consider this is a very good concept, very basic one for that, that kind of immunity of uh, future uh, industry for zero systems uh, based on artificial intelligence. But uh, do we have enough content in this uh, picture? So is this basic architecture enough? And we realize that not, it's not enough. Uh, we probably need a bit more options for this reality component, for this fake bad guy component and for the good guy component. So our uh, own uh, kind of invention there that we uh, consider reality with uh, three different options. So that reality can be like content as such, which is just passive one, or it can be proactive content. So content or some, some kind of smart content, also neural network driven. It's a kind of neural network called recruiter, which can uh, take 
uh, images with a particular distribution from this uh, real world. And the idea of this neural network is tries to represent reality in a most protective way. So it learns how to protect the reality also. And also it can be even generated reality so that uh, we can generate such cases which may never happen in reality, but still we can use it as a training uh, content to train our main actors like discriminator and generator. So that was uh, briefly about this. And uh, another player for uh, in this uh, neural network, and we have also two different roles for this player, is this kind of bad guy, fake generator. So it can either generate fake as a traditional gun or generative adversarial network, or it can generate uh, a kind of noise. It can be noise or style or background, which is sum up with an object on the picture or sample. And this sample will be uh, such with this noise that uh, our system, I mean, discriminators start to make mistakes. So there are like two options of uh, that attacker can use. And also our defender, it can be traditional discriminator, which just uh, can mm, tell from which source he gets this uh, sample, or we can train our discriminator to behave exactly as a clone of a well-trained decision maker, for example, human. So in this case, uh, this discriminator will be punished if uh, he is making decisions differently than the human here. So this is also our innovative component. So it means that we have uh, three main components and different options for each. And we create like in chemistry, we have this kind of periodic table of elements. We create uh, different uh, possible architectures of guns. And in this uh, paper, you can see for every architecture, for every uh, combination of these components, we have a specific properties that this neural network, uh, this combination of neural networks can have for protecting that uh, security or making or strengthen that uh, immunity of artificial intelligent system. So- Sorry, let's try to wind up. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. coming closer to this. So, uh, like, uh, just one, uh, want to say that every combination gives a specific picture and specific property. So you can read this from the paper. So coming closer to the conclusion. So we just uh, say that uh, uh, digital immunity, it's actually uh, the basis for self-protection mechanism for industry for zero systems. And this generative adversarial networks is suitable paradigm for that. So we suggest uh, like 12 different architectures with different properties uh, regarding this protection. And uh, finishing my presentation, I just uh, want to uh, uh, advertise our international master program, which is cognitive computing and co collective intelligence. Actually the first university program for collective intelligence where humans learn together with their digital clones and autonomous digital assistance. So notice that even if you are uh, afraid of uh, COVID and cannot come alone, then you clone can come, digital clone, and study in our master program. So thank you everybody for listening to me and uh, this presentation will be online. I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much Vagan. It was a nice presentation. And especially I liked your uh, last slide where one can attend your university without being physically there. That's a nice idea. Yeah, yeah. Okay. we have university for everything, actually. It's, uh, yeah. Very good. Uh, any question from the audience, please? Okay, meanwhile, we wait for the questions from the audience. Uh, Vagan, I was wondering, uh, you are using uh, generative adversarial networks, which are also used in deep fake. Uh, yes. So, I mean, usually we use this to fake certain things. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, 
it's uh, like a parallel. So when you are uh, creating perfect defender, so in a synchronously you are uh, creating a perfect attacker. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just your choice whether you are going to use uh, this kind of system for good or for evil, it's your choice. And also choice of, I mean, society protection system uh, to capture you if you misuse it. And that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Deepfake is based on a similar type of architectures. Yes, I was wondering about Deepfake and I thought, okay, um, uh, this is the first time I heard about uh, GEN. Uh, and I, I saw someone using it for positive thing rather than for destructive stuff. <laughs> Usually people are using it for like faking celebrities and doing some inappropriate actions. For um, oh. I have a question. So this for me, this comes down to the question, can I detect a lie or not? And then the next point is, can you detect humor? This would be some kind of lie, but. Uh, thank you for the question. So uh, we are in a safe uh, place here, just because uh, it's a very uh, theoretical uh, architecture. So we set several various architectures. And uh, when you configure a particular architecture for a particular task, I believe that everything would be possible. Definitely lie detection is one aspect because now convolutional neural networks are capable to detect at least with a high probability lies on the basis of even how your face looks when you're talking. It's just one thing. And uh, concerning humor, uh, because guns are usually used uh, for uh, picture processing. So if uh, you have certain humor hidden in your picture, then definitely this can be found, discovered, uh, but uh, it's not uh, yet so much done in detecting humor from texts, but uh, you give excellent topic. I will give it for my doctoral students to think about. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome and you have humor. <laughs> yeah, and now I'm also thinking how we will detect humor from a complete image, which is really depend on the perception of the beholder. Yeah, yeah, we must create digital clones of people. Then if you have sense of humor, then your clone must be able to capture it. Okay. And this is uh, now part of our task. And I'm very much thankful for this guy who asked me about it. OK, we have another question from Lucas. So Lucas, could you quickly ask your question? Uh, my name is Lukas Kaup. Uh, I'm from the Darmstadt University of Applied Sciences. Uh, and my question is, does uh, your work is very theoretical nature at the moment. Uh, do you have um, use cases or proven use cases where you can uh, auto... Uh, so so uh, cyber physical systems are really, really complex. And if you set it aside with uh, the smart factory, um, how you can train your or do you have a real world approach how to train such uh, uh, attacker uh, and and especially one real life attacks that you can prove in your system or architecture in any yeah. way yeah it, it's a good question and uh, the easiest answer for me because uh, our group has uh, also another uh, presentation during this conference where we actually show in real case of it and uh, we show uh, it's on the basis of uh, military logistics uh, lab uh, that uh, we have particular containers uh, uh, going around logistics system and uh, we have uh, cameras watching the process and we have possibility to create that kind of attacks to images which camera is seen and uh, we uh, try to generate vaccines, digital vaccines, so special images that uh, help to train system to actually still make right predictions what is going on. So it will be one of uh, our presentations during this uh, conference later. 
okay. believe tomorrow or day or a day after tomorrow. One of ah, us. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you very much. My colleagues Rudolf Frommler from Software Competence Center Hagenberg and Thomas Schlechter from uh, Fachhochschule Upper Austria. Uh, I thank you very much, all the presenters, and I also appreciate all the uh, participants of the meeting uh, for their interactive discussion and uh, for their patience. I hope uh, that we have learned something by these uh, five very nice presentations. And uh, for your information, we have two sessions tomorrow, uh, one at the same time, which is the second session regarding the um, security aspect. And also we have a, a panel talk, which is, I guess, at 11 CET. So please uh, do join us tomorrow and uh, thank you very much.